Welcome to Maximal Being, a podcast devoted to ditching fad diets and using real science to get you healthy and feeling great. I'm Doc Mock, a GI and functional medicine doctor who harnesses the power of gut health to get you achieving your goal. And I'm Jackie P, a well-informed layman who challenges the experts and asks the questions that you want. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button or leave a comment. And now, on to the show. You know, we don't know really what's going to help. We have some pretty good basic understandings when we look at food. You know, this is food, and this kind of food was available a thousand years ago. But this in, this, in this package with all these things on it that we don't even know what they are, you know, all these chemicals, we can't even pronounce them. That's not food. So, yep. you know, there's some very common sense things that we can change. You know, we can, we can change your, your well, I'm going to call it diet because nutrition is more like plasma chemistry that can be affected by even how you think and how you sleep. So we'll say, um, you know, uh, your diet your exercise, your, you know, uh, getting proper rest and, and how you think the mental attitude you have towards things. And, you know, there's a lot that you can do to support your body's immune system and support the normal function, your innate intel intelligence that, you know, the, the, somehow the brain communicates to your body and you got all these cells swirling around in your body, communicating to each other, and we can feed them in a way we can give them the things they need, not give them the things that are going to kill all those cells in your gut floor and, and change your immune system. So it's just making common sense. And if you want to do medicine with that, so be it, you know, especially if you've narrowed it down to a certain kind of cancer with a protocol that we know that works, I mean, okay, great. And what yeah. kind of food will support you while you're doing that? Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't have, you know, we've, we've said this time and time, Jackie P and we we have to go to commercial break, but if you don't have an organic mic in your corner telling you what your food's made of, you know, don't eat that food, but if it's a carrot, just eat that carrot. So We'll be back after this brief commercial break with Dr. Mike and Jackie P uh, talking about aloe. What's going on, Maximal Beings? It's Doc Mock here. Many of you are returning to the gym now, but some are not going back. Regardless of what you plan, Rogue has got the right gear to fit your needs. I personally own a barbell set and love it. The black op shorts are sweat resistant and flexible for getting deep in your squats. Head on over to MaximalBeing.com slash Rogue for our referral link. Order three items and they ship for free. And as usual, it's Doc Mock, and I'm here to maximize your pathway to wellness. If you're stuck at home and cannot make it to the grocery store, delivery may be the best way to stay clean and healthy. Instacart is the national leader in the direct-to-home delivery service. With numerous major chains and food from smaller stores, you can get those local veggies sent directly to your doorstep. Head on over to MaximalBeing.com slash Instacart and maximize your nutrition today. Welcome back, everyone. We have been talking about aloe, right? And it's funny because aloe, you see it everywhere and you don't, you don't think much of it, but it's just this magical thing that is just, is this unassuming plant, right? Uh, we've been here, Dr. Haley. Thank you for having us. Doc Mock, always wonderful to see your face. Uh, and I think it's time to get into some questions. I okay. So. Yeah. So we're going to go with the easy ones, Dr. Haley. And then we have actually some questions from listeners. And then I may or may not have some to add into the mix. So the first question is, what is your favorite exercise? Ah, uh, okay, we're starting off with a softball here. Okay. Softball. We're getting you warmed up. Just getting you warmed up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you know, it's funny because for me, and that's actually a good um, approach to my answer is I love playing softball. Um, I'm not nice. a fan of exercise. I'm a fan of activity that you enjoy doing. And for me, when it comes to exercise, a lot of people think, oh yeah, I exercise. I exercise five days a week. What do you do? I lift weights five days a week you know, um, or I run five days a week, you got to step back and look at the whole picture because that exercise you're doing is kind of like tunnel, vi tunnel vision benefit. You know, um, we want to do flexibility training. 
we might want to do some, you know, strength training, strength training might, you know, work to balance your hormones more than the stretching. And, you know, there's endurance exercises, um, you know, things that like, you know, when you do sprint work, you work different parts of your muscles and, and you're activating, you know, different uh, hormones. So when it comes to exercise, I like to make sure we're getting that full spectrum in some way that you enjoy. Now, for me, my favorite exercise, <laughs> I'm a drummer. So okay. about five in the morning, I'm out in my garage and my, uh, my wife's there with me. She's doing her yoga Pilates and I'm playing my drums. And you know that goes for maybe an hour every morning. Awesome. Uh, yeah, from there we go for, uh, she likes to go for a walk. I, I take my skateboard. Uh, and, you know, that's more of the, you know, fat burning type of exercise for me. Whereas the drumming, I'm probably doing a little more aggressive, a little more sweating, a little faster heart rate. I like to work behind the drum set, have a good time. Uh, so, you know, for me, that is, yeah, it's fun. And your exercise should be fun. Now, I do my lifting at work. I'm the, uh, the only male working at Haley Nutrition. I'm the guy that moves all of the, you know, 40 pound buckets of aloe vera. So, you know, I, <laughs> I unload the pallets, I stock the freezer, I pack all the boxes. I'm lifting, you know, 40 pound buckets all day long. And, and that's work. I don't know that they actually exercised a thousand years ago. Our lifestyles changed and exercise became necessary unless you were, you know, competing, you know, and had to train for, you know, ultimate fighting or something like that, you know, whatever they did in the arena. Uh, but nowadays, you know, I, I'm saying, man, just find something that you love to do. And can I throw it back at you? Uh, Jackie P, what do you do for exercise? Wow. It's funny you say that, actually. Uh, speak of things you love. Back when I lived in Florida, I used to practice capoeira, which is a Brazilian martial art. I can um, jinga. You can jinga? Okay. Sure. Dr. Haley, we're going to have to hang out when I come back to Florida, okay? Because we're, we're going to, you're going to rip, you're going to shred the drums and then, you know, I'll, uh, I'll dance to it. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I was talking to my wife. I was like, you know, I, I enjoy, I do enjoy lifting weights. I like squats and those exercises, but I don't have the endurance and I'm also losing mobility. I used to be crazy flexible. And I said, I used to get all these things from Capoeira. So actually I'm going back and I'm going to take my three and a half year old son and hopefully awesome. he'll like it. I won't force him, but if he likes it, it'd be awesome. It'll be our thing. Uh, so, cool. so, you know, funny you mentioned that because I was thinking the same thing where you say, do what you love. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going back to do what I love. I love that. And capoeira is definitely fun. You know, when you're training in capoeira yeah. and you got the music going, it's, you know, yeah. it's fun. It's a workout too. So it's, you get, you get all of the, all the above. Dr. Oh. Mock, what you're doing over there? Well, uh, you know, me in the Olympic weightlifting, um, yeah. I, I don't do it five days a week. I do it, you know, three, four days a week. And then I play the rest of the time. So go for walks, um, you know, play outside with the dog, hang from trees, all that sort of stuff. So, so I think I like, you got to balance the sympathetic stuff, the high intensity interval training, the endurance running and weightlifting with the parasympathetic stuff that will help you to kind of get level and be a balanced human being, just like you said, Dr. Mike. Yeah. You know, that's so well said though, because a lot of us don't take the time to properly rest and breathe and, you know, we're, we're using, you know, this much of our breath, you know, and for those only listening, I'm showing like a small section from finger to finger, but, you know, let me spread my hands apart and we should be taking much deeper breaths and, and we're not, you know, really having that parasympathetic experience, even when we try to sleep at night, cause we're so wound up and drank too much coffee. And so that's a good word. Yeah. Layman card. We got to break down parasympathetic. Let's let's get into it a little bit more, so those listening can maybe incorporate that into their routines. Yeah, sympathetic is fight and flight, right? So like your reaction under stressful situations, and so when you're activating your sympathetic nervous system, you're doing things that elevate your heart rate, that get the blood flowing, 
parasympathetic is resting and digesting and sex, right? Like our last podcast, we had a, a sex therapist on. True. Yep. And those are the things that you do to kind of bring that back down to steady state. And the delta between those two is called heart rate variability, which we talked about way back, I think episode seven or eight. Um, heart rate variability is a good measure of how balanced your sympathetic and parasympathetic systems are. And your favorite fitness tracker can usually tell you where those numbers lie in kind of a quantitative format. Did I do a good job breaking that down, Jack B? You did. You threw some math words in there, delta and quantitative. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know. It's a yellow you know, flat. Yellow flat. Yeah. <laughs> South says yellow. It was good. Delta means yeah. change. Quantitative yeah. means numbers. Yes. And you, I might you be do able, a better job of that number stuff than I, I do. I'm the numbers guy. If we ever yeah, have a math that. podcast, ooh, yeah. man, don't yeah. you guys watch out. No, I'll just say uh, <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Next question, Dr. Haley. Favorite health book and why? You know, I've read a, a few of them. And the one that probably had the biggest influence on me was Jordan Rubin's Maker's Diet. And what I, what I liked about this is it got us thinking about the things that we eat from more than one perspective, meaning he'll step back and look at things, not only from a scientific perspective, you know, but also a traditional perspective. And for him, uh, I believe he was a Messianic Jew. So he looked at it from a biblical perspective. And a lot of times, you know, in the ancient writings, we see a lot of wisdom when it comes to things like diet. Um, and, you know, for instance, it might be written that it's okay to have beef, uh, but not pork. And we might know beef to be a healthier meat. But when it comes to beef, we might recognize that traditionally those cows are supposed to be in the field eating grass. And when it comes to the animal foods, whether it's the dairy, you know, or you're, you're having cheese or milk, or you're having the animal meat product from that, you know, it, it would be better if it was traditionally raised eating grass. And we know that scientifically that animal food is going to be higher in, you know, omega uh, threes uh, and not the omega sixes. So it's going to be less inflammatory and going to have more anti-cancer properties because it was fed the right diet. So that book had a big influence on me. I'll always kind of step back and say, okay, is this real food? Is it real food? You know, did it exist a thousand years ago? And in the case of animal foods, you know, how was it raised in the case of vegetation? How was it grown? You know, was it, was it sprayed with pesticides? Is it organic? We know that organic fruits and vegetables scientifically have been shown to have more nutrients. They're smaller usually and darker color, but that, that color and that flavor and that aroma in the fruits and vegetables and the vegetation, that flavor is nutrients. So, you know, you, you look at those three things and I'll, I, I got that from Jordan Rubin's first book, Maker's Diet. He, I think he's written, you know, 20 or 30 books since. I've read a couple of them as well. Uh, so he's been probably the biggest influence on me. And then Dr. Natasha McBride, I got to go give her a second because she wrote uh, two GAPS books, Gut and Psychology Syndrome, which was about how the gut affects the mind. But I like her second book. I'm looking at my desk because I'm thinking it was right here, but it's not. The Gut and Physiology Syndrome. The P was changed for the blue book that she wrote, Gut and Physiology Syndrome. And I think I like that one better. It just gave a really unique perspective of not only the gut, but soil outside, because she kind of equated the soil outside to your microbiome. And, you know, Doc Mock, I, I, let me throw this back at you, because, you know, when it comes to intestinal health, the things we eat, you know, we chew our food, hopefully, and start working in some digestive enzymes and stuff. And it goes into this acidic environment. And, and it, as it, you know, it goes into the small intestine, the enzymes are breaking it down. But essentially, that is being fed to our microbiome that essentially turns it into this bio sludge. You know, and she equated that to soil outside and how important it is for the soil to be 
like that. And, you know, to have all that microorganisms growing in the soil. But I guessing it makes sense that essentially the food in our stomach is really soil for our intestines. Yeah, I, I think so. And in fact, you know, uh, we see this in people that have, say, an excluded colon, um, that the colon will actually atrophy and die if it's not given butyrate. And we see it in people that have short gut, that if they don't get glutamine and amino acid, that the small intestine will die. And that if you give glutamine, it'll actually grow and redevelop. And so we have this really interesting symbiotic relationship with, with our gut. And it gives us useful compounds, you know, like vitamin K is made in the small bowel and, um, and, and we give it many things and it's, we're constantly cross-talking and um, finding out more about it, despite the fact that it has been with us since the dawn of time. The literature is just getting there now the last decade, but really the last three decades, if you look uh, kind of beyond that. And, and we're doing some, some huge work in that in the pancreatic cancer space, actually. So stay tuned for that over the next few years. Wow. Thanks. Nice. Okay. Okay. We're going, we're going. All right. Next question. What is the craziest diet you've been on or heard of? Oh boy. You know, that's a funny question. Let me tell you what I think the dumbest diet I've ever done was. And uh, that was after getting out of college and having a little extra weight. And I did the, uh, I'm going to call it the Fatkins diet. I don't think it was the Atkins <laughs> diet it was the Fatkins diet. Uh, because that's all I ate was fat. And there was no really requirement. It didn't matter as long as it was, you know, fat and protein and, you know, meat and cheese and eggs. And that was all I ate. I lost weight, but it was definitely not a sustainable, you know, lifestyle. And, you know, I've, I've learned from then I've done low fat diets. I've done, you know, low carb diets. I've done the gaps diet. I've done only salads, only juice. There is one crazier diet I did though. And I was testing it at the time going about, this is back like 25 years ago. I was baking bread every day. And I wondered what would happen if I only ate bread for like a month. <laughs> <laughs> so bread, and I loved the bread I was making. It was, it was, you know, whole wheat with flaxseed and all of these things. And it worked for me too, you know, nowadays, you know, I, I never wrote a, wrote a, you know, book, the bread lovers diet, you know, uh, I thought about it, but you know, that wouldn't fly, especially with all the gluten that was in it. Uh, but you know, it didn't affect me. I'm, you know, I, I've got this like half Italian thing and, and most Italians, you know, we could, we could snort a line, line of gluten without sneezing. I mean, you know, <laughs> we, we were made for gluten, gluten eating machines, but most people wouldn't get away with that. So, uh, yeah. That was a no. Well, you know, and I would dare say, speaking of nuance, that, that might have been a more of a uh, food experiment than a diet, right? Because you said you're wondering. The wonder part, like, mm, that's, it was a pursuit of science, I'd say. Paleo, keto, vegan, and carnivore. Maybe you've tried them all, but did you have success? Are you still doing that diet? Turns out there's not just one diet right for one particular person. By understanding how your body works and the relationship behind your body's workings and these diets, you can then approach the perfect plan for you. In the Perfect Human Diet course, we talk to you about your body's inner workings and the pros and cons of each plan. We discuss how our ancestors ate and have eaten and lay a framework to tailoring a plan that is perfect for you. To learn more about the Perfect Human Diet course, head to MaximalBeing.com slash courses to find out more. And as always, I'm Doc Mock, and I'm here to maximize your health. You cannot supplement your way to health, but there are things that we need to add to our lives that can maximize our pathway to wellness. The American diet is virtually devoid of omega-3 fatty acids, which play a major role in cardiovascular disease, gut permeability, and mental health. Personally, I take omega-3s every night and iHerb is the best place for clean, natural sources of supplements. I love the Zenwise Omega-3 Fatty Acid Supplement, which is free of fish burps and good for the environment. Head on over to MaximalBeing.com slash iHerb, that's I-H-E-R-B, and enter the code B as in boy, D as in dog, 
B as in boy, 5528 and receive 10% off your orders for all supplements. Maximize your supplements with iHerb. Nice, nice. All right, so we have a couple questions from listeners. Um, and we'll, we'll do this rapid style because we're kind of uh, coming to the time here. So uh, the first question, which I think is interesting, I know we covered uh, the different parts of the aloe, but they say, what part of the plant do you use, right? And uh, like, can you do anything with the roots? Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you do a little search for how to flay aloe vera, it is going to be a video of me um, on Google showing how <laughs> we do it. And essentially, there's a proper way to do it that eliminates the bitter part. And the aloe literally comes out not tasting like anything, none of that bitterness. And then you're getting only the meat from the leaves. Um, if you do look at that YouTube channel that that, part, that particular video is on, there's, you know, all kinds of aloe farming videos. There's one which was interesting because you asked about the roots in particular. And it's a popular video. It's well done. It's got, you know, probably a couple hundred thousand views, maybe more than that. But we, I took the plant out and essentially cut the roots out and I pulled all the babies out and replanted them. And I think we got like, you know, 25 or 30 babies out of that one mother plant. I cut the roots off and uh, put the mother back in without the roots. And then those roots that were the original roots, I planted somewhere else and it grew a whole bunch of aloe plants. Wow, that's cool. So we got that 25 or 30 babies out of the mother. We got a whole new farm out of the root system. And then there was a follow-up video where about six weeks later, I pulled that same original plant that I stuck in the ground with zero roots and it had a bigger root system on than it had just six weeks earlier that I cut off. Wow, that's cool. So wow. it's an amazing, amazing plant. And yes, every part of that plant is usable in one way or another. Uh, so you might want to check out the I, aloe farming videos. I can verify. I did a quick Google. First thing I see on top of the results are your hands, Dr. Michael Haley. So he's <laughs> out there, folks. You find him. You find him on there. He'll show you how to fillet. Thanks. All right. Next question. Um, and this is a more historical question. Um, but do you know when were the first uses of aloe reported? You know, I'm told that there's there's uh, carved in stone in the tombs in Egypt, aloe vera, and that it was, you know, historically a, a treasured plant and, you know, known for all of its beauty and life giving uh, qualities. I never really got into the history too much. I know that it's written about in the scriptures and, you know, Jesus was wrapped in aloe and, you know, it's got a very extensive history in healing and, you know, beauty. So, you know, people, wow. we, people use it on their skin, you know, for anti-aging and skin tightening and all kinds of wonderful things, sun protection. Yeah. That, that just reminds me, we didn't even touch on the cosmetic, you know, side of that, right? Maybe, maybe a part two uh, of that. We um, lost all the dermatology listeners. They're just all yeah, like, what? At this point. Yeah. I want to talk about my dry patch on my T-zone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hang on a second. I got to get it out there. I got to say it. If you, Do. if you search on YouTube, uh, raw aloe for my vagina question mark or something like that um in that i do because people want to know can you use aloe vera there and you know and the female parts and stuff i do talk around it about a little bit of, but i also show i demonstrate how to use aloe on your face and how you're on your body and how to cut it and use it uh it is very cool if you watch that video and get yourself a leaf and experiment a little bit i think you will enjoy the results Yes, I can also concur. I see here also lovely kitchen. Um, uh, yep, it's on here and a lot of videos about that too. So, you know, you could almost Google anything in YouTube and you'll find a video about it, um, which I guess can be a good or a bad thing. Um, okay, fire it on. Now these are we got to we got to do rapid fire. The the, the time is on us. Uh, the first uh, the next question, which is, um, what dose? what do you use for constipation? And I yeah, yeah. 
I, I don't recommend aloe vera for constipation. You know, I, I recognize that the outer leaf might have some, you know, increased motility aspect to it, but I think you're treating the constipation improperly and you need to figure out what's causing it. So I'm not Wonderful. the guy to give you a, a, a advice on that one. Doc Mock, anything to add there? I saw, I yeah. saw, I saw your face. I know there's something <laughs> going up in that big old brain of yours. Uh, I mean, we we don't have a lot of time, but we briefly touched on the appropriate dosing: um, 0 0.04 grams to 0 0.14 grams. And the data are limited in terms of IBS, but you know these trials kind of group IBSC, IBX mix, mix type, and IBSD all together, and so it's kind of hard to hash that data out. I want to see just an IBSC group with the outer leaf uh, employed. So. Go for gotcha. it. Back at you, Jackie. And as the non-resident doctor here, there was a question that says, I have Crohn's. Can I use aloe? Can we lump that question into the previous question as well? Yeah, um, I feel like we talked on that too. It's, gotcha. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and then we discussed the uh, abdominal right diarrhea. Are there other side effects of aloe? You know, I don't hear of people having side effects with it. And you know, Doc Mock, I'm going to jump in on one thing, and I know we touched on it. We're limited on time. I think one of the reasons that people don't want you consuming aloe vera for some of the inflammatory bowel issues is the mucopolysaccharides are essentially long carbohydrate chains of sugars. And the concern, I think, might be like fermentation and bacterial overgrowth and all these other things lumped together. But the reality is, mannose, the sugar molecule that makes up that ACE mannan, the mucopolysaccharides. Sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm red flag, red flag. Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, also the first time someone has layman flag yeah, themselves. themselves so. yeah. <laughs> That's great. I'll let yeah. you take it from there. Go it's ahead. Go ahead. Break mind. it down a little bit. Yeah. E you know, essentially aloe vera is made up of a bunch of sugars. And, you know, we think of simple sugars like, you know, glucose and fructose and, you know, lactose and milk and stuff like that and go lactose. And a lot of these simple sugars, bacteria grow in them very well. Other sugars and specifically mannose, mannose is a very different sugar molecule and it is not as conducive to bacterial growth. Yes, things can grow in aloe, but it's a much slower rate. And in fact, research done on mannose demonstrated that it, it's kind of like the cancer cells would try to eat the mannose. They would attach to it. They couldn't digest it, but they couldn't release it. And therefore they couldn't eat glucose because it's almost like if you took too big of a bite out of an apple and you couldn't open your mouth enough to release that apple, you couldn't eat anything else. Therefore, you starved. And the conclusion was that aloe vera, the, the, not aloe vera, the sugar molecule from it, the mannose, was starving the cancer cells. It's a very different sugar. It processes different. We can't treat it like all the others. Yeah, and uh, we're going to come to the end here, but I also found some trials where they coated produce in aloe, and they found that it's actually antibacterial. It prevents the fruit from aging from bacterial fermentation. So pretty cool stuff. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. You know, Jackie P, my, my tail's been wagging the entire podcast. It, it's always great to connect with you. But, you know, Dr. Haley, as a, a co-Floridian, uh, what a pleasure. I mean, I think we spent our days the same way in the pool. And, um, you know, thank you for all your wisdom today. Where can people find you? You know, the, the best site is probably drhaley.com, drhaley.com. And from there is links to everything else. Wonderful. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Leave, leave us a comment. And uh, that helps us to get the word out. Um, the meal prep boot camp has been flying off the shelves the last few weeks. I think people are just at home again because of COVID. And they're wondering how to deal with this food that they have piled up in the kitchen and wanting to get it broken down and ready for the work week quickly. So thank you all for your patronage there. Um, head on over to MaximalBeing.com. There's a ton of free information. You can connect with us or any of our guests at team at MaximalBeing.com. And as always, I'm Doc Mock here with Jackie P and Dr. Haley, and we are here 
to maximize your health. What's going on, Maximal Beings? Doc Mock here. If you haven't done so already, leave us a comment and hit the subscribe button. Let your friends and family know. That way we can get the word out and continue to bash the bro science.